The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold. Inside the snow globe on my father's desk, there was a penguin wearing a red and white striped scarf. When I was little, my father would pull me into his lap and reach for the snow globe. He would turn it over, letting all the snow collect on the top, then quickly invert it. The two of us watched the snow fall gently around the penguin. The penguin was alone in there, I thought, and I worried for him. When I told my father this, he said, Don't worry, Susie. He has a nice life. He's trapped in a perfect world. Chapter 1 My name was Salmon, like the fish. First name, Susie. I was 14 when I was murdered on December 6th, 1973. The newspaper photos of missing girls from the 70s most looked like me, white girls with mousy brown hair. This was before kids of all races and genders started appearing in milk cartons or in the Daily Mail. It was still back when people believed things like that didn't happen. In my junior high yearbook, I had a quote from a Spanish poet my sister had turned me on to, Juan Roman Jimenez. It went like this. If they give you a ruled paper, write the other way. I chose it because it expressed my contempt for my structured surroundings, a la the classroom, because not being some dopey quote from, the, from a rock group, I thought it marked me as a literary. I was a member of the chess club and chem club and burned everything I tried to make in Mrs. Bell Minico's home ec class. My favourite teacher was Mr. Bott, who taught biology and liked and liked to animate the frogs and crawfish we had to dissect by making them dance in their waxed pans. I wasn't killed by Mr. Bott, by the way. Don't think every person you're going to meet in here is suspect. That's the problem. You never know. Mr. Bott came to my memorial, as, may I add, did most of the entire junior high school. I was never so popular, and cried quite a bit. He had a sick kid. We all knew this, so when he laughed at his own jokes, which were rusty before I had him, we laughed too, forcing it sometimes just to make him happy. His daughter died a year and a half after I did. She had leukemia, but I never saw her in my heaven. My murderer was a man from our neighbourhood. My mother liked his border flowers, and my father talked to him once about fertiliser. My murderer believed in old-fashioned things like eggshells and coffee grounds, which he said his own mother had used. My father came home smiling, making jokes about how the man's garden might be beautiful, but it would stink to high heaven once a heat wave hit. But on December 6th, 1973, it was snowing, and I took a shortcut through the cornfield back from the junior high. It was dark out because the days were shorter in winter, and I remember how the broken corn stalks made my walk more difficult. The snow was falling lightly, like a flurry of small hands, and I was breathing through my nose until it was running so much that I had to open my mouth. Six feet from where Mr Harvey stood, I stuck my tongue out to taste the snowflake. Don't let me startle you, Mr Harvey said. Of course, in a cornfield, in the dark, I was startled. After I was dead, I thought about how there had been the light scent of cologne in the air, but that I had not been paying attention, or thought it was coming from one of the houses up ahead. Mr Harvey, I said, you're the older salmon girl, right? Yes. How are your folks? Although the eldest in my family, and good at acing a science quiz, I had never felt comfortable with adults. Fine, I said. I was cold, but the natural authority of his age and the added fact that he was a neighbour and had talked to my father about fertiliser rooted me to the spot. I built something back here, he said. Would you like to see? I'm sort of cold, Mr Harvey, I said, and my mum likes me to be home before dark. It's after dark, Susie, he said. I wish now that I had known this was weird. I had never told him my name. I guess I thought my father had told him one of the embarrassing anecdotes he saw merely as loving testaments to his children. My father was the kind of dad who kept a new photo of you when you were three in the downstairs bra bathroom, the one that guests would use. He did this to my little sin sister, Lindsay, thank God. At least, I was in at least I was spared that indignity. But he liked to tell a story about how one, 
how once was Lindsay was born. I was so jealous that one day, while he was on the phone in the other room, I moved down the couch. He could see me from where he stood, and tried to pee on top of Lindsay in her carrier. This story humiliated me every time he told it. To the pastor of our church, to our neighbour Mrs Steed, who was a therapist and whose take on it he wanted to hear, and to everyone who ever said, Susie has a lot of spunk. Spunk, my father would say, let me tell you about spunk. And he would launch immediately into his Susie Peel on Lindsay story. But as it turned out, my father had not mentioned us to Mr Harvey or taught him the Susie Peed on Lindsay story. Mr Harvey would later say these words to my mother when he ran into her on the street. I heard about the horrible, horrible tragedy. What was your daughter's name again? Susie, my mother said, bracing up under the weight of it, a weight that, shi that she naively hoped might lighten some day, not knowing that it would only go on to hurt in new and varied ways for the rest of her life. Mr Harvey told her the usual, I hope they get the bastard. I'm sorry for your loss. I was in heaven by that time, fitting my limbs together, and couldn't believe his audacity. The man has no shame, I said to Franny, my intake counsellor. Exactly, she said, and made her point as simple as that. There wasn't a lot of bullshit in my heaven. Mr Harvey said it would only take a minute, so I followed him a little farther into the cornfield, where fewer stalks were broken off because no one used it as a shortcut to the junior high. My mum had told me my baby brother, Buckley, that the corn in the field was inedible when he asked why no one from the neighbourhood ate it. The corn is for horses, not humans, she said. Not do not dogs? Buckley asked. No, my mother answered. Not dinosaurs? Buckley asked. And it went like that. I've made a little hiding place, said Mr Harvey. He stopped and turned to me. I don't see anything, I said. I was aware that Mr Harvey was looking at me strangely. I'd had older men look at me that way since I'd lost my baby fat, but they didn't you but they usually didn't lose their marbles over me when I was wearing my raw blue parka and yellow elephant bell bottoms. His glasses were small and round with gold frames, and his eyes looked out over them and at me. You should be more observant, Susie, he said. I felt like observing my way out of here out of there, but I didn't. Why didn't I? Franny said these questions were fruitless. You didn't and that's that. Don't mull it over. It does no good. You're dead and you have to accept it. Try again, Mr Harvey said, and he squatted down and knocked me against the ground. What's that? I asked. My ears were freezing. I wouldn't wear the multicoloured cap with the pom-pom and jingle bells that my mother had made me one Christmas. I had shoved it in the pocket of my parka instead. I remember that I went over and stomped on the ground near him. It felt harder even than frozen earth, which was pretty hard. It's wood, Mr Harvey said. It keeps the entrance from collapsing. Other than that, it's all made out of earth. What is it? I asked. I was no longer cold or weirded out by the look he had given me. I, I was like when... I was like I was in science class. I was curious. Come and see. It was awkward to get into, that much he admitted once we were both inside the hole. But I was so amazed by how he had made a chimney that would draw smoke out if he ever chose to build a fire that the awkwardness of getting in and out of the hole wouldn't, wasn't even on my mind. You could add to that that escape wasn't a concept I had any real experience in. The worst I had to escape was Artie, a strange looking kid at school whose father was a mortician. He liked to pretend he was carrying a needle full of embalming fluid around with him. On his notebooks he would draw needles spilling dark drips. This is Nito, I said to Mr Harvey. He could have been the hunchback of Notre Dame, whom we had read about in French class. I didn't care. I was completely reverted. I was my brother Buckley on our day trip to the Museum of Natural History in New York, where he had fallen in love with a huge skeleton on display. I hadn't used the word Nito in public since elementary school. Like taking candy from a baby, Franny said.